Dear viewers of Vincent Van Stanley Think Tank, today I have a special treat for you. A nice meeting with Professor Tomasz Lachowski, and we will talk about Ukraine, Russia, Poland, international law, and uh, the, the Euro situation ever since 2022. And we'll touch upon annexation of Crimea. We'll talk about the international law perspective from the perspective of victim and from the perspective of the uh, superpowers as well. Just to explain you, I mean, Professor Lachowski does not need any introduction, but uh, just so you know, so you can um, catch up with the speed of his current um, engagements, he's about to become a professor of Łódź University, where he graduated his a PhD in 2016 and he published ex extensively and uh, he published in the domain of international law, international relations and that's very very rare because in order to connect those two you need to work much harder than majority of uh, well scientists in this field so um, I would like to thank you on behalf of the national relations society as well because uh, it's difficult to persuade lawyers to do what you do because most of the things which you do is pro bono so can you tell us from your perspective how does it look the situation from the perspective of the international law of what happened in ukraine on the 24th of february 2022 First of all, thank you for this kind introduction. Uh, I'm really privileged to be here with you, uh, Dr. Pietrzak, and to, to discuss those issues from the perspective of international law and international relations. Frankly speaking, I do believe that those two areas uh, can, uh, can be combined, uh, not just uh, uh, in, in uh, let's say, at the university, since there are some courses that covers that cover uh, not only international law but also those IR perspectives but also as uh, part of this bigger discourse on international affairs and the biggest challenges of today's world. So I, I do feel uh, myself as a part of IR society as well as international law society since for me it is kind of natural to, to work uh, somewhere between or to try to combine those two areas of researchers. And uh, moving to your question about Ukraine and about situation in Ukraine, uh, 24th of February last year, of course, it changed a lot. However, in terms of international law, we have to point out that uh, the act of aggression of the Russian Federation against Ukraine, it commenced not last year, but it, com it commenced uh, uh, nine years ago in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea, with the illegal occupation of Crimea and uh, the outbreak of the war in the eastern part of Ukraine, which is named Donbas uh, in the Ukrainian language, also other languages uh, like Polish and Russian. Uh, that is, um, just, to, just to make it very clear, the, the ongoing act of aggression of the Russian Federation, it lasts for nine years. So it is more than Second World War uh all together so we have to we have to uh, take into account that in the middle of europe the war uh which is devastating uh, at least for the last year uh, it it takes so much time in in the perspective especially of the victims because they are suffering uh from uh the russian armed activities and so if i can um, if I can eval ev evaluate this, those activities from the legal point of view, first of all, the act of aggression. So this is the crime, the act of aggression of the uh, state, but also of the individuals, of the closest top political and military uh, leadership of the Russian Federation, that is uh, Vladimir Putin and other people that are mm, in the top of the Kremlin. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, uh, we are witnessing, unfortunately, uh, numerous cases of uh, different war crimes, crimes against humanity, and up to my mind also genocide. Since, uh, according to my research, according to my, uh, I would say, um, legal assessment, those crimes can be qualified also as a crime of genocide. 
We've just touched upon that because we recorded a similar video in Polish, but could you uh, tell to our viewers how how much uh, Rafael Lemkin influenced your research, your early research, and to what extent uh, you see crimes such as crime in uh, Katyn, Jednoje, or um, Strebrenica in Rwanda, how are they connected to Bucha, Irpin, Mariupol, how from your legal perspective, those things are related. Yeah, thank you for this question, since uh, I do believe that uh, Rafael Lemkin, who coined the term genocide in international law, he was a Polish lawyer of Jewish origin. Uh, he was the first lawyer in the world in the history of humankind who thought about crimes that are directed not uh, against individuals, but against a whole communities, a whole groups. Uh, so it, it was this, this, this turning point uh, in, in the history of international law uh, when Lemkin uh, discovered that crimes, that the victim of a crime may be also a group, a national group, ethnical group, uh, racial, religious, political, social, different kind of groups that are being, uh, there, that are oriented to be distracted by uh, especially totalitarian and imperial states. Lemkin thought about genocide as a crime of imperial or totalitarian or colonial nature. That is uh, the asymmetry between this uh, huge machinery of a state and uh, the group of victims. And if we analyze mm, uh, the historical Soviet crimes as cutting massacre against uh, Polish officers, not only Polish in terms of ethnicity, because there, there were also people of Ukrainian or Belarusian or Jewish origin that were part of the Polish army and they were also victims of the Katyn massacre in 1940 uh, because of the um, activities of the Soviet officers, the Soviet authorities. Uh, during those times, those crimes were committed in the name of ideology named the new Soviet man, Homo Sovieticus. And in uh, very different parts of our region, not only Poland, also Ukraine, we have to point out the great famine, Holodomor in the Ukrainian language, which was uh, committed uh, because of the organized uh, artificial famine uh, organized by, namely, Joseph Stalin and other people from uh, the top leadership of the Kremlin of 1930s, in 1932-1933, uh, cutting massacre of 1940, then deportations of people of Baltic states, deportations of Crimean Tatars uh, of 1944, and many other crimes. They were all committed in the name of this ideology of Homo Sovieticus. Uh, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, after the short break of democratization, Russia has started his policy of rehabilitating the Soviet legacy. And actually Putin uh, is, uh, is in love with Stalin's uh, criminal record. And so the Soviet Union is being uh, constantly re rehabilitated by the Russian uh, Federation from the legal, political, also social point of view, uh, educational point of view. And I would say, I do believe that today we, do, we have another ideology named the Russian world, Ruski Mir in the Russian language, or the Russian order, uh, which is the ideological basis of those genocidal practices against this time Ukrainians. And you mentioned Bucha, Izium, Mariupol, and other places very of very horrific crimes. Uh, someone can point out that there were, especially in Bucha, maybe hundreds of, 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 of victims, but not millions like in the Holocaust. But uh, according to Lemkin, and fortunately, according to the Convention on Genocide, which is somehow uh, uh, somehow changed by the negotiating, was changed by the negotiating parties because of their political interest. Uh, nevertheless, also in the terms of the Convention, it is possible to claim that even uh, a small part of, uh, of a group when it is being destroyed with an intent to be destroyed, um, we, can, we, we can claim that it is a genocide. And 
if we take into consideration all of those places, uh, so that is those uh, territories under occupation, uh, in which the Russian soldiers were looking for uh, the Ukrainian elite, for Ukrainian politicians, activists, so for military veterans of uh, the Donbas war 2014 and 15, we can have some links to the Soviet attitude uh, to the nations like Poles, like Ukrainians, like Balts uh, during uh, or before the Second World War, during and after. So. Uh, I follow Lemkin in his understanding of genocide and I try to present this understanding uh, in accordance also with the convention since as lawyers we have to be strict to the binding law and I do see uh, places in the convention in which they, they are telling for instance that tr that forcible transfer of the children uh, of the Ukrainian children to the Russian group and it is taking place constantly. Uh, it is a biological genocide, one of the possible examples of genocide under the convention. So it is a legal, um, I would say, um, confirmation that uh, the crimes that are being committed can be qualified as genocide as, as well. In terms of the genocidal acts uh, used by Russian federations against Ukrainian people, can you say how the international law uh, understands rape committed during the war, in this particular war? Because what we've heard ever since February 2022 clearly illustrates that rape is used in a very systematic manner uh, in Ukraine. So from the perspective of the law, how do you um, understand it? Sexual violence, especially since uh, the legacy, uh, the judgments of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, uh, which was dealing with genocide that was also based on rapes and sexual dominations of one group against another, uh, the courts stated many times that sexual violence, it is part of uh, the convention of the, of the definition of the convention, uh, those are those conditions uh, stipulated by the convention uh, by which uh, the group of perpetrators is trying to, is intentionally trying to uh, destroy the group of victims. So uh, we can we can we can say that uh, women or men uh, who are raped, they uh, don't have to be killed to say that they are victims of genocide, since it is a, an act of domination. M many times, uh, a consequence of such, uh, uh, of such crimes, there are children. And also, it is, uh, at least from the political, ideological point of view, uh, one of the means to, uh, to reshape, uh, in terms of biological uh, structure, the society or the nation, which is uh, being uh, victimized by the sexual harassment, has sexual domination and violence. So uh, those situations in Ukraine, they, are, they, are, they also fall within the ambit of the legacy of the uh, Tribunal for Rwanda. And uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, in the International Criminal Court in The Hague, which is uh, investigating the crimes in Ukraine, also uh, the Office of the Prosecutor is uh, uh, inquiring those uh, examples of uh, sexual violence. And actually, uh, I was also a participant of different international conferences during the last couple of weeks or months. And I, I see that uh, especially Ukrainian lawyers are, are putting on the table this question of sexual domination, since, since it is one of the mean of uh, uh, military activities. So like during the, the time of the Soviet Union, the history is being repeated. In our chat before this recording, we mentioned that you even see the intent, clear intent of the actual army doctrine used to basically to, to the massive extent. Is that not against the Geneva Convention? I would say that this intent is rooted uh, not even in military, of course they are uh, they are um, exercising, they are, they are executing those ideas that are rooted in the Kremlin. 
um, I would like to draw uh, our our listeners, our our viewers attention to the Vladimir Putin's speeches on Ukraine, especially of February last year, just a couple of days before the war and uh, in the aftermath of the full scale invasion, when he re re repeated many times that Ukraine is an artificial state, which was invented by Lenin, Vladimir Lenin that a uh, Ukrainian nation is fully a project of the Soviet Union, that it never existed before. Uh, he named uh, Ukrainians as uh, Malo Russians. Malo means uh, little Russians uh, in terms of uh, our Slavic languages, also in Polish, but also in Russian and Ukrainian. Um, uh, he's undermining uh, the factual existence of the nation then He's undermining the legal sovereignty of the independent Ukraine uh, of uh, 1991 uh, boundaries that are uh, recognized by international law and by many actors of international relations. Uh, his um, uh, journalists, his broadcasters, which are mainly uh, pr promoting and, and product, producing, uh, producing propaganda, they're also saying that uh, uh, Ukrainians are products of Satan, they are uh, Nazis, they are drug addicts, and so on and so forth. This is the clear dehumanization of the Ukrainian nation, just as it was during the Third Reich in terms of Jew Jewish population, or in Rwanda. Yeah? So, so we, can, we, can, uh, uh, we can draw this conclusion that, uh, that the intent and intent of the genocidal acts is rooted directly in the Kremlin. And also this kind of situation uh, in which Moscow, uh, also from the Tsarist time and during the Soviet Union, uh, it perceived itself as a center of a de facto colonial power. And Ukraine was a colony, was inner colony, was de facto colony of Moscow. And Putin is trying to uh, is trying to restore the empire, the Russian Empire, by also undermining the position of, of Ukraine. Uh, so in terms of Putin and his ideology of Ruski Mir, the Russian world, Ukrainians can survive only after they accept this ideology of the Russian world with the Russian-centered approach, Russian uh, language, Russian Orthodox Church and Russian culture. Uh, and, and here, I do see those connections with the Soviet crimes under the Homo Sovieticus ideology. And even though uh, there are many differences between Ruski Mir and Homo Sovieticus, Homo Sovieticus based on atheism and communism, and here on nationalism and uh, close ties with the Russian Orthodox Church. So in theory, something completely different. But in reality, it is a continuity of the previous practices by today's Kremlin. Well, today's Kremlin uses a very strong propaganda against Ukrainians. They are definitely um, twisting the reality in their favor. But here is, historically speaking, this region, the region which is inhabited by Poles, Ukrainians and Russians, the history is very diversified. And uh, historically speaking, once Russians were aggressors, once there were aggressors who came from Poland, Ukraine also happened to be uh, at times um, misbehaving when it comes to certain situations, let's say. Uh, but after 2022, what is happening, what is clearly happening, uh, is derailing the bilateral relations between Ukraine and Russia and multilateral relations between Russia and the rest of the Western world. As an IR scholar, do you see a chance for reconciliation between Ukraine and Russia, between Poland and Russia, between Europe and Russia? Uh, no, in terms of uh, this uh, short perspective, for sure not, because, uh, because we do speak about those crimes, the heinous crimes that are still being committed. Uh, Russians uh, are, unfortunately for them, they are part of the totalitarian society. Uh, some parts of those uh, open society 
um, the Russian Open Society um, islands, they are being they are being still constantly uh, devastated by by the Russian Federation, like very symbolic uh, liquidation of the Memorial Society uh, that happened last year uh, as a consequence of the judgment of the Supreme Court of the Russian Federation. So it was a society, Memorial Society which was trying to deal with the Soviet crimes. So it is a very, very clear message from the Kremlin that, uh, that uh, since we are liquidating a uh, memorial, which was trying to come to terms with the Russian past evils, so we accept those crimes. It, it is our nature in terms of the Russian thinking. So if they accept the Soviet crimes against Poles, Ukrainians, and if they accept crimes against Ukrainians in the contemporary world, so I do not see any possible uh, possible place for the reconciliation. Of course, in the future, it should be possible, but uh, it uh, needs uh, a very concrete change uh, in the Kremlin. I, I, I mean, not only Putin, but... Uh, Putinism as a, as a system, which is rooted uh, in the Kremlin's elites, but also, unfortunately, in the Russian society. Mm -hmm. And here I want to speak more about those positive uh, situation of uh, relations between Poles and Ukrainians, uh, because here it is this moment to uh, to find this this common path uh, to to find this common future for our two nations. We are not only neighbors, we are not, we are now friends in many different, uh, different dimensions. Ukrainian, Ukrainian uh, refugees are here, but I, I, I want to speak about them as Ukrainian friends or Ukrainian neighbors, Ukrainian uh, fellows, uh, mates, because they are, they are here. And so we, we communicate with them and we can actually do it better than our politicians because because politicians always they have some uh, have some interest behind uh, their actions and uh, normal people society uh, they are without those I would say burdens so so and obstacles so uh, so those uh, relations between our nations are extremely strong right now uh, and it is also because of Putin so so we can thank thank you Mr. Putin yeah Thank you, Mr. Putin, for bringing us so much supporters and allowing us to send all of this uh, equipment, beta <laughs> equipment, which we don't need, to our friends in Ukraine. And thank you for modern modernizing our army. Uh, seriously speaking, uh, Professor Lachowski, could you tell me more about a symbolic nature of something which happened in March 2023? Who is Professor Piotr Hofmanski? Can you tell me more about it and explain to our uh, viewers what actually happened in Hague? Yeah, Professor Piotr Hofmanski, he's a Polish lawyer, but uh, what is more, more important, he's the president of the International Criminal Court in The Hague. So uh, the, only, the only criminal tribunal which is based on the treaty, on the international treaty named the Rome Statute and uh, 123 um, states in the world, they accept the jurisdiction of the ICC. In March uh, 2023, uh, the ICC pre-trial chamber number two, it issued uh, two warrants of arrest against uh, Vladimir Putin and Ms. Maria Lvova Bielova, uh, who is in theory uh, the children's uh, commission, uh, the commissioner of rights of children in the Russian Federation. However, in reality, she's responsible also with Mr. Putin for war crimes that are basically based on the forcible um, deportation of the Ukrainian children from the temporarily occupied territories by the Russian troops, mm -hmm. namely in the south and in the east of Ukraine. And those children are being moved uh, to Russia. They are uh, most of them. They are not orphans, so they they possess. They have their own parents, but they were just stolen uh, by the Russian troops. And even uh, Miss Lvova Bielova, uh, she she also sto has stolen one boy for, from Mariupol. Uh, 
uh, in, in theory, uh, in theory, uh, he is, is, is entitled, he, he, he is ought to be her son, but of course it is just a war crime. Uh, and uh, those children are being re-educated uh, in Russia in special schools, in special camps, uh, in the name of this Russian ideology of Ruski Mir. So we do uh, see this connection that they are brought up, they are educated in the anti-Ukrainian, anti-Western uh, ideology of the Russian Federation. And uh, Putin is a person, uh, as a president, who decreed those uh, legal provisions. He signed uh, legal acts that were entered, uh, that entered into force in the Russian Federation. Uh, for instance, people that want to be parents of those children, they can get some uh, financial, financial support. So it is very clearly legally based uh, uh, system of war crimes in the Russian legal domestic system. And this is why uh, it, it happened very quickly that after the request of the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, which was uh, lodged in the pretrial chamber, I think, uh, I think uh, in, the, uh, in the late February this year, just after three weeks, the pretrial chamber has accepted uh, this request and issued those warrants of arrest against Putin. Putin, uh, even though he's a uh, head of a state of a non-state party, but 43 state parties, including Poland, other states of the region, also from the Western world mainly, uh, they requested the prosecutor to open an, an investigation. And this is why it is possible also to, uh, to, 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 to inquire and in future prosecute and punish uh, perpetrator which is uh, that is uh, coming from non-state party and also because of that the immunity of a head of state does not play any kind of a role so 123 states they have the legal obligation to capture to arrest uh, Mr. Putin and surrender him to the Hague and uh, up to myself it is extremely historical moment when the Polish lawyer uh, standing on uh, the highest position in the court in The Hague, uh, he read this uh, warrants of arrest uh, for Putin. So for the, uh, this, this emanation of the Russian Federation, but also ideology and those crimes that are still being committed against the Ukrainian population. Thank you much for this response. Uh, professor, uh, I have a question related to which university, because you are full professor, almost full professor soon, <laughs> and, and I keep my fingers crossed. And I just want to ask you about the, this initial response in February 2022, how uh, University of Łódź authorities were helping to Ukrainian refugees, how the common people were behaving in these months, these months were, uh, that when, when the war started, the middle of the winter, minus 20 perhaps, and how, how how did the society of Wuzki mm. region behave? I'm very grateful to my university because uh, the university authorities were very uh, decisive and uh, they decided to, to help the Ukrainian students that were, uh, they were studying at our university. Uh, very quickly, um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of student dorms were adopted for the Ukrainian refugees that were coming to, to Łódź or other, other cities. Um, also, uh, our university opened some projects for the Ukrainian scholars that, that could have applied. And so we uh, used to have, or we are still having some Ukrainian researchers at, at our university uh, who, who, are, um, uh, who are entitled to, to use, of course, our libraries. They can, they, they, they can read their lectures, provide uh, uh, all seminars for students, they can work, they can si simply live their lives, of course, abroad, of course, uh, uh, being uh, still victims of, 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 the, of the aggression, but it, it, is, it is something extremely positive and I'm really grateful for my university, also for students, uh, because they were extremely uh, fast in organizing the help for, he, for their uh, Ukrainian uh, friends and their, and their families, Many, many different, uh, many different uh, actions were uh, were undertaken by students and also, of course, society. 
our Polish uh, society uh, moved to the Polish-Ukrainian border uh, for many weeks uh, that there were volunteers helping people uh, to, to have this very first shelter, food and, and other, other uh, necessary things to, uh, to, 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 to survive for a couple of days. Many of us, because we can say like this, uh, they also they also uh, invited uh, Ukrainian friends to our own homes to, to our places. Uh, so it is, I think, it is it is uh, something that that um, it is an evidence of those very close ties between Poles and Ukrainians. And as, as I said, as I said before, not as a, a rule of the politicians or some you know uh, some decisions of the highest authorities, but the uh, very crass rooted uh, actions undertaken by the society so i think that this is uh, it is something that it shall be mentioned and uh, frankly speaking i'm i'm quite often inv invited for many for instance virtual uh, lectures i'm providing for students uh, for different states uh, last last week i was reading a lecture for the philippines and also one of the main question was uh, was about the Polish approach, uh, the approach of Polish society uh, to the Ukrainian refugees, people that were uh, that were forced to leave their own homeland. So it is something that we have to be proud of, and it is something that it is visible even uh, in the second part of the world, which is also very uh, very useful from the political point of view and the IR point of view, since we can we we, we do possess some potential. Uh, to say that we are not just neighbors, but we are a hub for Ukraine uh, as a state uh, for for the um, transfer of, of, for instance, uh, weapons, but also this humanitarian, I would say even power, humanitarian yeah, power. Just, just to remind our viewers, some 8 million Ukrainian refugees crossed our borders last year to Poland. Not all of them stayed here, of course, because some of them migrated to, to Western Europe or Southern Europe. But the response of the Polish society has been incredible. I completely agree with Professor Olachowski. And I just want to ask you, because from your perspective and from the perspective of many of my colleagues in Poland, this is a natural thing. But, you know, um, people in the South or, or in the West, they are a little bit like hesitant. They don't want to offer so much help and they are quite reluctant when it comes to uh, asking the question about the Ukrainian transatlantic future. So how do you explain the fact that there is there are more uh, there's more reserve there than in, in Poland? Is it that we understand them we, we understand Ukraine or their situation from our historical perspective or or is it because we, we just want to help? Yeah, of course, we understand them better because of our historical connections. Uh, like Timothy Snyder many times uh, has spoken about our region that this is, this is, these are bloodlands uh, because of many totalitarian regimes and imperial regimes that were committing crimes. Uh, they were waging wars in our region. So, yeah, we do possess this kind of historical legacy. And even, of course, like new generations, we didn't leave during those days, but it is something in our nature. Uh, Western powers, today's Western powers like France or Germany, um, Germany especially, it is um, a state also with problems of their own history, but France, it is a state which uh, did not experience the Soviet tanks uh, uh, in Paris on, or, or other cities, so uh, they don't perceive uh, the Russian imperialism or the Russian politics as something uh, that might be seen as a threat to their own existence or their own security. So it is our mission to try to convince them uh, for our argumentation, and I think that there is uh, that we can mark some turning point in this discussion since, uh, for instance, Germany, uh, a couple of weeks ago, they accepted to transfer this uh, very modern Leopard tanks to Ukraine on the front line. Uh, now, uh, the German ca Chancellor Olaf Scholz is making another decision, uh, very pro-Ukrainian. So, uh, it, it, so it is an evidence that it might be possible 
if there is a, if there is a political pressure on a, on a, this enough level to to convince not to force to convince them that it is our common uh, issue common affair uh, Ukraine is a part of Europe and they want to become also formally legally speaking a part of the EU or NATO but they are in terms of mentality culture uh, they are a part of our continent of our values they are defending our values on the front line uh, during the revolution of dignity on Maidan in 2013 2014 uh, Ukrainians were being killed uh, handling the EU flag so it is something that we have to take into consideration maybe not we in Poland because we understand it but in France in Germany in those western powers you mentioned the south of course the south like Greece like Spain uh, politically they are especially Spain Spain is uh, also assisting Ukrainian soldiers um, uh, in in their in their um, education of them on, on, on the modern uh, weapons uh, tanks so 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 it is visible however we also have to understand that society uh, is oriented more on the Africa North Africa or on the Middle East so also it is our kind of uh, diplomatic mission to find this common ground for our decisions to, to be taken within the EU and I think that uh, uh, I would say that France and Germany they failed especially during those first couple of months uh, to play the role of the leaders of Europe they failed however the EU succeeded because the EU as an organization which is very often criticized because of many different reasons and different uh, different angles of, of, of view however up to up to my mind it succeeded uh, in those decisions on imposing sanctions on the Russian Federation and those crucial decisions of transferring of transferring weapons and helping also in the humanitarian way the Ukrainian society uh, so uh, so to sum up this uh, this answer for to your question uh, I, I think that it is visible that uh, our perception of Russia as well as as well as it was in the history of the Soviet Union is something real it's not our Russophobia it is something real and we have to uh, stand together against this Russian aggression of course Pol Poles and other nations they, they are not on the front line but they are providing assisting aiding to uh, those people who are physically on the front line and who are being killed constantly by the Russian aggressors to uh, to to fight against this uh, aggressive war. Our geopoliticians surely would uh, say that Ukrainians are now now fighting our war because potentially if the Ukraine had failed, Russia's the Russians would have knocked to our doors now. So basically, Brzezinski, Kiedroyc, uh, Miroshevsky and perhaps some other um, thinkers in this tradition would definitely agree with this statement. I have just one last question, if I may, and that relates to the future. So, Professor Lachowski, I'm sorry, but I would like you to speculate a bit. So, would you mind to tell me your assessment? Tell me, in your opinion, when Ukraine could join European Union, and is it possible for Ukraine to ever join NATO? very hard question i don't know when but i do believe that it will happen uh, in, in relation to the eu and also uh, concerning the, the nato possible accession uh, first of all uh, we have to um, take into account that th those dynamics of politics of last year is extremely visible and is and is something that uh, it reshaped those uh, very Mm, long-lasting decisions of the EU for instance uh, the uh, the status of the candidate to the EU was granted last year just after a couple of weeks after the aggression of after, after the full-scale war waged by Russia um, many other states they waited for a couple of years to be granted this kind of candidate status so it is a very first step to become the EU member. Of course, uh, this path is very difficult uh, since uh, the harmonization of the Ukrainian legislation, domestic legislation to the European law, uh, it might take a lot of time as it was in Poland and Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary and other 
uh, other uh, states of our region. However, I do believe that this desire uh, showed by the Ukrainian population, firstly on Maidan, then in Donbass 2014-15, and today, especially today, when they are defending the common, our common values, it is also something uh, which, is, which is also visible for the EU leaders. And as I said before, that I generally uh, see that EU has uh, successfully uh, moved uh, through this very difficult time. Uh, I do believe that decisions that, 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 that are going to be taken by the EU leaders and the particular state leaders will, will follow this, uh, this, this, this previous decisions that Ukraine is part of Europe. When, when it comes to NATO, of course, it is more difficult since uh, uh, NATO, uh, I think so, that it will not uh, um, uh, decide uh, for Ukraine to, 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 be, uh, uh, to join the NATO if the war is not uh, finished, uh, uh, especially under uh, the, the final treaty, the international treaty with the security guarantees and also the consequences, the legal consequences of the Russian aggression. However, uh, President Zelensky, Ukrainian President Zelensky, he's many times underlining and repeating that Ukraine is a de facto uh, member state of NATO. And I do agree, since uh, the Ukrainians are fighting with our NATO uh, weapons, uh, NATO tanks, uh, maybe in the future NATO jets. They are being also um, uh, those drills, they are taking place in Poland, in Great Britain. Great Britain, of course, it's not in the EU, but uh, it used to be in Spain. So, uh, uh, of course, it is in NATO, because we are talking about NATO right now. Uh, Great Britain, um, of course, it's in NATO, but not in the EU. Uh, so, uh, I would just want to sum up that uh, I'm, a, I'm an optimist, and I see the place for Ukraine in those two organizations since they deserve to be one of uh, one of our family they are they are uh, one of the members of our of, of our family but it shall be confirmed from the formal and legal point of view in the near future and uh, for me it is just a, a question of a time but not a question if it is a question of when thank you much for this interview thank you much for your comprehensive answers and i hope that this very interview will will start very fruitful collaboration between University of Łódź, University of Sofia and Institut Nascendi Think Tank. So thank you much for your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.